it's still still worth doing. And I think people also tend to see this as a lengthy thing to sit still for an hour, which is uh, difficult when you think of how much time we very quickly piss away <laughs> on wasting on on the internet and stuff like that. Like, we all have the time to do this. There's no one who can't spare an hour out of the day. That's definitely the case. Um, So this is sort of a big part of where the Neoplatonic school comes from, um, is this language divide. Uh, this is important for us just in terms of the whole basic ideas um, of invocation, evocation, well, particularly for evocation, because that concept doesn't exist without, without, without that divide. Because the Neoplatonic school was the first kind of ones, to, they, they were coming up and saying, okay, well, you know, this world down here, and then we have the world of forms, where there's the pure form of everything that's a completely idealized reality. And the whole concept of an idealized reality would have been incomprehensible in that uh, harmonious sort of concept of the liminal space that we saw in what is traditionally understood as the pre-modern world. And I just think uh, we are less aware of exactly how that is integrated into our lives and, and reacting for it. So what I would encourage people to do um, because the more you think about, okay, like, I've got this idea, or I have this desire, or I have this situation that I want to enter, I've got an annoying coworker, so I'm just going to, like, try to banish him very quickly. The more you, like, regularly incorporate that stuff, the more you come to live in that world, and just the more straight-up effective these rituals are. Um, and like I say, this is basic stuff, but... I think that the, the principles behind it aren't something that we always clearly look at. Um, sometimes the most basic things are very deceptive in the ideas that they contain. Um, and, I, I think, and I think once you start kind of learning to think in terms of the pentagram and the hexagram, it reveals a lot about A, how you're interacting with the world around you, and B, about your own personal desires, how you categorize things. And this is really important, uh, particularly for the, for the Lima, because the idea is supposed to be we're trying to discover our true will. And that's not something that you just like know, or just come up with, pull out of your ass. Like uh, it doesn't work that way. Uh, it takes a long time to really come to um, a definite idea of that, because and particularly we live in an environment where we are surrounded by completely manufactured desires from advertising and stuff like that. We have certain ideas of what success is, uh, of what you know a good life is that don't necessarily jive with what we actually want. And sometimes it's very difficult to separate that because people are under tremendous social pressure to uh, live up to a particular idea of, you know, what what is a good life, what is a successful life. I, I, like, I, you know, I, this is for me personally, I always find it's funny when I have someone in my home because my home is set up completely to do this or to write or, or play music, you know, like I, ha I don't have a couch. I have no need for a couch. Why would I have a couch? Like one chair. <laughs> that's all I really, that's all that's required of me because that's what I'm using this space for. I could go to the effort to set it up to look like everyone else's living room, but then if I did that, then, uh, you know, that would interfere with what I actually want to do and what I actually want. But it, make, it, it makes people uncomfortable when they're in that space because it just, it's not what they're used to being surrounded with when they're in someone's home. Uh, pardon me. Um, so really we have to learn to chuck a lot of that, and it's, that's really easier said than done. I mean, we'd all like to think that we're so independent and so uh, set apart from the crowd or whatever, but the fact is human beings are hardwired to seek approval from others. Um, it's a big part of our psychological process, it's our social programming, it's all these things. And that takes a lot of work to undo, it's not, and it's not something that you permanently fix or permanently get rid of. Just like the true will isn't something that you permanently set out and define and it's like, okay, well now I know my true will. It's all figured out. Now I know my desires and the work is over and I can you know, lay on the bench and drink margaritas all day and fuck these rituals because why should I even bother doing this anymore? I, I'm, I'm finished. Like, there's, no, there's no end point to any of this work. Just because the world around us is constantly going to be working to implant more new desires that aren't co-harmonious with what we're doing. And the true will is an evolving thing. Um, it is a direction. And it is, a, I know it's kind of a cliched metaphor, but it is valuable to think of it as a path that you're on. Because if you are walking on a path and you're consistently walking on that path, it's not going to be the same thing every day. You're going to come across new stuff. Um, 
And I think that this is, because it's very deceptively comforting to think that we're doing all this really hard work. Because, I mean, this, this stuff is really hard work, and it's really consistent work. Um, it's really comforting to think that someday we're just going to be done. We can go on to something else, but it doesn't really work that way. Um, oh, what else did I want to say? Um, okay, one, one, I want to talk briefly in terms of invocation about just the basic difference between, because we talked about the pentagram ritual and the hexagram ritual, which essentially involve classifying elements and planets and so on and so forth. This gets a little more complicated when you're dealing with actual entities. Um, particularly because there is a tendency, I think, to over-rely on a one-to-one -one classification of particularly the pagan gods. Um, whereas, you know, we, we like to think, okay, well, you know, this is the goddess Ishtar, she is associated with Venus, or, you know, this is the god Horus, he's associated with Mars, and whereas in reality, what planetary hexagrams, what kind of elemental planetary energy we want to establish in our rituals has a lot to do with the aspect of the god or what we want to get out of the god more so than actually like uh, a strict one-to-one -one of that energy. I mean like Ishtar, for example, like, uh, she, like she's a perfect example, you know, she was the, the, the central goddess of Babylonian culture for a long time, so it wouldn't be inappropriate to use Jupiter or the Sun to invoke her like that. Then again, she's also a goddess of war, so it wouldn't be appropriate to use Mars to invoke her like that. Then again, she's also a goddess of sex, so it's not inappropriate to use Venus to invoke her like that. And really, depending on why we want to have this conversation, why we want to have uh, the presence of this entity, and what we want to use with that energy, that's how we kind of decide how we work out the planetary stuff um, in particular. And that's I would say that has more to do with the hexagram ritual and planetary invocations than it does in elemental rituals. One of the big mistakes that's very easy to make is to create a, a sense of elemental imbalance by specifically just using one pentagram. I mean, even if I was going for a pure elemental spirit, like one of the old Greek spirits or something like that, um, I, I always personally will invoke all four elements before doing the greater ritual of that particular element, just so you have some kind of foundation. I mean, there's a reason these things are divided into four. That's our solid number. Those, those are the solid pillars. So we can stand on that foundation and then work to invoke something higher. But I think it's important to have that foundation because if you focus too much on one energy, you just naturally you naturally create an imbalance. An imbalance is something that you never want. Um, Crowley uses the analogy uh, of riding a bike uh, to discuss this. Just, you know, you can't if you go too slow, or you just you know go in one direction, then you know, your bike's going to fall down. You got to go fast. And actually, the faster you're riding, the more solidly you are set on that path, the more progress you're making. Because otherwise, if you slow down, you wobble and you fall, essentially. And that I think is very a very apt uh, analogy. Um, everyone has at one point or another fallen into a rut in their life. I'm sure, like all had that experience of just kind of, this is too much of the same, too much of the same. And these things are really a way to shake you out of that. And sometimes it can be very difficult to do. Um, but the, 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 the fact of the matter is, I find even when I have a very negative experience uh, with, for example, a ceremonial evocation, which some of which I've had recently, so those are very fresh in my mind, just the fact that something happened even if it was really scary or really negative, is an uh, incentive to continue and do more because you realize, okay, one way or another, this is working. Whereas if you're just banishing or just doing simple invocations, like just doing a pentagram ritual and stuff like that, sometimes it's hard to know if you're getting a result. It's like, you know, I mean, when Crowley says uh, that when we banish, we should have a feeling of cleanliness, and when we invoke, we should have a feeling of holiness. It's like. I don't know, do I feel more holy than yesterday? It's hard to tell. Let me get out my holy meter. Like, it doesn't, it's very difficult to, uh, to pin that down. Whereas if you're trying to contact a spirit, you kind of know right away. Either you talked to something or you didn't. Either something showed up or it didn't. One of those two things happens. So you kind of know whether you got a result. You know, when we do evocations, technically, uh, usually we're doing it for a reason. We want 